Conversations with Nikki is brought to you by studyapps.co.za, South Africa's leading education app for tablets. Welcome. It is Conversations with Nikki. I'm Nikki Seberini. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, it is a delight, a privilege, an absolute pleasure to be with you. This is the station that keeps you entertained, informed, and inspired. I'd like to welcome our syndication partner listeners. Um, first of all, Bay FM, Wilds Coast FM, Nisner FM, MC 90.3 FM, that's in Plettenberg Bay, West Coast FM, Kaui FM, Chai FM, and Eldos FM. Um, thanks for all the emails. Loving, loving the emails. Um, and a lot of you who have been in touch and have made some fantastic suggestions, you'll see this, the shows will start to roll out. Um, I, I always like to start off the show talking about the fact that this show is for you. It's about conversations that we all need to be having as mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, friends, um, companions, colleagues, uh, really just, just discussions and, and open opening our minds and, and hopefully our lives and our hearts as well. So please do keep the conversations with, go, uh, with me going. Um, you can visit the website, Conversations with Nikki. It's one word, Nikki is spelled N-I-K-I, and that's .co.za. You, uh, you can communicate with me on that website. You can also follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Seberini, Seberini spelled S-E-B-E-R-I-N-I. And you can also look at my Facebook page, which is Conversations with Nikki. Wow, today we're having a very interesting and a very important conversation. The 35th President of the United States of America, John Kennedy, said, A man does what he must in spite of personal consequences, in spite of obstacles and dangers and pressures, and that is the basis of all human morality. And that's an interesting quote because... When I read that quote, I see a lot of pressure. I see a lot of pressure on men. I see a lot of pressure on masculinity and responsibility um, on top of that as well. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. Men in our society, their roles, equality, all of these things are, are going to be discussed today. So I'm going to introduce my first guest who I, I was very privileged to interview her a, a, a year or two ago um, after she had won a, an award. She, she's a South African award-winning photographer. Um, you've probably seen her, photog her photographs. Sometimes you, you don't even know that she is the genius behind the incredible image. Um, it was her photograph of Bibi Aisha, um, a woman from Afghanistan whose ears and nose were severed um, by her husband and brother-in-law, um, that was selected as the World Press Photo of the Year in 2010. And that really, I mean, and Jody has been running around South Africa for many, many years taking pictures of uh, the goings-on behind the scenes here in South Africa, also now traveling the world. And then, as I said, doing us incredibly proud with winning these kind of awards and br bringing those these awards home. So Jodie, welcome. Thanks um, a lot. It's great to have you in the studio and to be chatting again. Thank you. And this time we're going to be talking about such an important exhibition um, that's taking place at the Goodman Gallery at the moment, um, your exhibition, and it's called Quiet. Um, before we get to Quiet though, because I think it's so relevant to talk about this picture um, that, that won you this uh, prestigious award, the photograph of Bibi Aisha, because you know, she, she's a symbol of, of women in this world. She's a symbol of um, hope in the world. And you, you seem to have captured all of that. And, and I think we need to start off talking about that because even though we are going to be talking about men, and, and on this panel who judged, they, they were judging, you know, who, who would win the photograph of the year. Um, one of the judges, Vince Aletti, said, um, it's a terrific picture, a different picture, a frightening picture. It's so much about not just this particular woman, but the state of women in the world. Maybe you can just tell us very briefly the, the story around the, the picture, taking the picture of Bibi. Um, I met Bibi Aisha by doing a Time magazine assignment, and she was staying at a shelter called Women for Afghan Shelter mm -hmm. in Kabul. And I met with her there and her social worker, and I was told her story. Um, which um, she comes from a village in the southern provinces of Afghanistan and she was given away as barred, like 
because there was a crime committed in the family when she was 14 years old and she was married at 14 to a very abusive husband and she lived with her mother-in-law who was also abusive. Mm -hmm. Eventually when she was 18 she decided to run away and she ran away to her neighbor but her neighbor handed her into the police and in Afghanistan if you run away from your husband you go to jail. Mm -hmm. um, she was sent to the jail in Kabul and then she received amnesty and her family took her back to the village and the village had a tribal court which said, you know, we must cut off her nose and ears to teach other women in the village not to run away from her husband. And she was taken into a clearing, and they held her down, her family and her husband cut off her nose and ears. And she was left for dead, and the American military found her and looked after her until she could get to Kabul. And now, from the photograph that was published widely, and there was a lot of discussion and controversy around the photograph, um, not the photograph, the text that came with the photograph, um, she's found herself in America, um, living with an Afghan-American family, and she's having reconstructive surgery. And it's happening now. The it's, yeah, oh. it's all happening now. I mean, we've all seen the picture. It was on the cover of Time magazine. I remember my, my shock and horror at seeing that picture. What was it like meeting her face to face, seeing a person without a nose and, and, and without ears? You know, I've traveled quite extensively through the world and I've had to cover like women um, who have been raped extensively. Um, in the Congo by soldiers. I've worked extensively here on domestic violence and gangsterism and child abuse. So how I try and adapt to it is that I have to be like a psychologist in a way and make Bibi Aisha feel that I'm not really taking any notice of, you know, not having a nose. And so I'm very casual mm -hmm. and I ask her, like, I think she looks beautiful and, you know, I just chat to her as a normal young woman and that relaxes people. And then also you have the pressure of creating something that's special. Mm -hmm. And so for me, we, we worked in a very small room. I was with a social worker and my translator and I really wanted it because I noticed immediately how beautiful she was. Mm -hmm. Like her beauty Absolutely. stood out a lot more and her like presence mm -hmm. than her nose. Mm -hmm. And so I really through communicating that I thought she was amazing and could she like give me her inner power, you know, through herself. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create a contradiction between the horror and the beauty of the woman and that's really what the photograph is about. And that's what comes through, that's what won you that award Jodie. Do you think it was a life changing moment for her when you talk about finding her power in that moment? I don't think, I think for her it was, I know that at that present moment they were waiting for the American, um, em not embassy, well embassy to, to give her a visa to get to America so she could have surgery mm. but it was taken a while and because of the response to the photograph the next minute she was there. Wouldn't it be lovely for you to be able to take the photograph after the surgery? Imagine that. I don't know, <laughs> I sort of let go of Did things. You? Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, totally, oh. you know. Maybe we've all just held on. Yeah, no, she, mm. no, I mean I've been to America twice mm -hmm. and I've met her twice but since she's moved um, to this American family, Afghan American family, I haven't been back to America. Mm. Jodie, coming back to South Africa, you've already put two books together. Um, you've had a number of very successful um, exhibitions. Before, again, before we talk about Quiet, let's just look at your one exhibition, which I've, I found very interesting, um, of women um, all in their, in their underwear, um, beautiful, beautiful, all different women, different shapes, different sizes, and posing, and it's called Real Beauty. What, what was the, the uh, motivation behind that exhibition? Well, very much when I was in my early 40s, I sort of felt <laughs> like, wow, I'm a little more comfortable than mm. before in myself. Mm. And I sat with one of those high-flying models um, that are in vogue, mm. going from London to Paris, and she opened up the magazine and started giving me all the dark secrets about how unperfect all these models actually are. Mm. 
and she had bags underneath her eyes and she was going to do a magazine shoot and she said it doesn't matter in Photoshop they're just going to remove you know mm, the bags the bags yeah. and then the imperfections the imperfections and then I was living in London at the time and I heard a BBC interview how like in South Africa in the black community women who are more voluptuous are seen as healthy and more sexy but now things are shifting where women are black women specifically are getting more anorexic and are sort of identifying more with the Western body shape. Mm. And so it was very interesting for me to create a project around real beauty where I put posters up everywhere in different areas. Women phoned and came forward and I photographed them in their underwear, in their environment. The way they chose to post was very much their fantasy or what they believed was how they want to project themselves. Mm. And yeah, a lot of issues came up in, in this project around South African issues, around beauty and body shape. And now it's going to be published in a book in German and English. Wow. Um, it's coming out as soon as I can get... Um, at the end of May, I'm going to the production line to look at the colors. Mm -hmm. And I've got beautiful writers on board. I asked Feriel Hafiji, mm. um, Lauren Bukas to write, um, Pumla Gope. Strong woman. Yeah, Mika Bal, who's mm -hmm. an academic in Holland, and Mishket Krifa, who's an Algerian uh, French woman, to just write anything they wanted on real beauty. So there's beautiful essays in the book as well. Oh, Jody, I'm looking forward to that. Maybe we'll, we'll chat again when that comes out. So that brings us to present day. It brings us to a very exciting... Um, an enlightening exhibition called Quiet. You tell us about it. Okay. So as you can see how I'm speaking about my work, I've covered a lot of issues around women. Mm -hmm. So I'm not naive what happens in South Africa mm -hmm. and in around the world. Mm -hmm. But I'm an avid um, fan of exercising. And at the gym there are three screens so for a year I'm looking at CNN I'm looking at the music channel and I'm looking at a sports channel right and for me I thought wow it's very interesting how men are represented it's always in reference to power corruption war politics business and always in the performance of something and then I thought of my boyfriend and my brother and people I know that you never actually see the quiet side of man, the vulnerable side of man. And I thought to myself that if we continue always seeing the other side of men and not that side, what do our young men grow up believing? I believe that gangsterism, I believe a lot of the violence in very different communities, I even believe um, music, you know, influences the way things repeat themselves and so I thought why not do something completely different strip men down in their underwear and basically try and find their quiet vulnerable moment how difficult was it to put something like this together it was really <laughs> difficult <laughs> how, I'm, I, I, men listening now would, would you would you do something like this? I think for the woman, the real beauty, it's about do I look fat? You know, how do I look in this picture? That for men, as you say, you, they're showing something that's very, very deep. Firstly, um, men, we are more used to women exposing themselves. Mm. And therefore, when I put those posters up for real beauty, the phone didn't stop ringing. Mm. When I put posters up, for the men, no one phoned. No one responded. Interesting. Absolutely. And the higher position of in society that that man was, I knew most of the time it was going to be a no. Not because they didn't believe in the project. Mm -hmm. They believed totally in the idea of what I was doing, but it would not be accepted. And it, sh it shows you the pressure that is put on men. The, the facade, the shield. Yeah, but men the have armor. to be something. They mm. are expected to be something in the world. So, so Jody, how did you find men to pose in their underwear? I went to friends. I went to acquaintances. 
anyone that knew a man, which we all know mm. of someone, and that's how I found the men that I photographed. And they chose, it was in their homes? Yes. Why, why was it important to photograph them in their homes? Because the home is a comfortable space for them. And if you're in your underwear, to not be at your home would sound, would, you know, I, I just wanted a place of comfort. Okay. And and yeah, and also the environment. And not that I used a lot of environment. I think the work is much more around feeling. And so it was definitely more comfortable for the men. And how I got them <laughs> to strip down, Stripped I down. said, because I knew nothing really about all the different types of underwear. No. But if you actually look at them, they are they like swimming trunks. Mm. A lot of them, mm. you know. And I I had no prerequisite of what kind of underwear you should wear. So I just said it's like being at the beach. Yeah. Which it is. Sort of. Ish. It was an interesting experience. Many of the men fell asleep during the shoot. Did they? Men are not used to actually doing nothing. Well, how long would a shoot take? Three, four hours. And depending on... That's, uh, again, very interesting, that. Very. Really depending on, on, on how comfortable they started off and relaxed and I could see through the you know the watermelons and the first pose is the watermelon pose. What's the watermelon pose? Where you've got rugby balls or soccer balls <laughs> underneath your arms. Solomon's doing it next to me right now. <laughs> so what is that Solomon? Is that just a strong man looking okay the water with that, did they all just yeah. immediately stand up with that pose? And then... No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not going to accept it. <laughs> and okay, then we just so worked and worked. And at one moment, it, it's a very interesting experience. You capture something that is where the guard is let down. Mm -hmm. And it is that vulnerability. And therefore, many of the men loved their photographs, but there were men that really don't like their photographs. Well, one in specific. But do you still have, are you still exhibiting that photograph? Totally. Or? Okay. I mean, it's one of my best photographs, but it is showing a vulnerability. Mm. Mm. Did do you think a transformation took place within those two, three, four hours from the watermelon pose to relaxing to showing the vulnerability? Do you think they were able to access something and a shift happened? Well, I'm not sure they were aware of how they... I mean, they knew exactly what the show was about. Mm. But you can't ever imagine how the photograph's going to come out. But they... Uh, the way I found the guys, like, it wasn't just about saying yes. I really said, then you've got to let yourself... You have to open yourself to this experience. How fascinating Jodie and of course this is you, you're going a lot deeper with this because it's not just looking at men in society and the power and the masculinity and showing the, the vulnerable side you, you're looking at a much bigger message within the context of not only South Africa but the world I mean we started off talking about Bibi and it was at the hands of men in a very patriarchal society that she suffered such terrible abuse with with absolutely no rights at all so you you're having interesting discussions at the Goodman Gallery I mean people People um, in powerful positions are talking about the role of men in our society. Maybe you can just expand on that. Yeah, um, we're having two panel discussions. One is um, on masculinity, power, um, equality and justice. Um, and the other is going to be the media um, in relation and art in relation to masculinity and if anyone's interested we've got great panels it's in line with Sonke Gender Justice, Justice Network and it's at the Goodman Gallery so please contact them to find out More. Mm. and then what I'm also doing is that while I was researching my project I found um, this American named Jackson Katz who speaks about masculinity, he goes off to the army, he goes and speaks to sports, sports fraternities, he goes and speaks to policy makers in America speaking about masculinity. And we will be, with the help of the American Embassy, we're going to bring him here in May. Wow. Having the discussion about the role of men? It will be a discussion around men and gender 
related Again. issues. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think it's a it's a good time then to introduce our next guest, um, who we we so delighted has come in short notice um, to to talk to also to talk about this particular subject and men in our society, manhood, masculinity. So it's Rurik Makaiza. Makaiza. Rurik, welcome and uh, thank you for for joining us. Thank you very much, Nikki. It's a pleasure to be here. So, you've got a lovely voice. Thank you. you My really wife says that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, well she's not wrong. So, Rurik, I mean, you, you've, you've heard about Jody's exhibition, yes. Quiet, mm-hmm. men in a, in a quiet space, showing the vulnerability. And you're here really representing the um, Mankind Project. So, maybe before we talk about Jody's yes. exhibition and your thoughts on that, maybe you can just tell us about this Mankind Project and, and what, what, what it is that you do. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, the Mankind Project uh, started in Milwaukee, Wisconsin about 25, maybe 30 years ago mm-hmm. uh, by three men that were inspired about what it is that they can do for men in the way women has been empowering themselves. So mm-hmm. there was a lot there for, uh, for women, but not a lot out there for men. So three guys, Bill Kauth, psychologist, an academic, Ron Herring, and uh, a U.S. Uh, Marine, um, Rich Tosi, came together in their kitchen and uh, conceived the initial idea of uh, what a training for men could look like. 25 years later, there's uh, at least 50,000 men that has done the training, uh, generally in the English-speaking world, but there are also communities in the the Germanic and uh, the uh, French-speaking parts of Europe, and um, we're going strong. Uh, There's at least one training that happens every weekend uh, anywhere around the world, and it's a lot of fun. Um, But what are you doing? What kind of training for So what is it that we do? Uh, In a nutshell, uh, I would say it's uh, an initiatory experience um, supporting men to go inwards and journeying literally from their heads into their hearts. Do you... Let's look, at, let's look at men. I mean, I started off, you didn't hear my quote. Um, John Kennedy says, said, a man does what he must in spite of personal consequences, in spite of obstacles and dangers and pressures, mm-hmm. and that is the basis of all human morality. And I right. think that's a lot of pressure. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of pressure on men to provide. There's right. a lot of pressure on men to perform, to do. Um, we're not going to go into the equa- gender equality right, right. now. Uh, do, do you think that bringing up young boys in the world today um, and, and trying to grow them into responsible young men who can make their way positively in the world, is there a secret ingredient involved? I mean, is, is that why the, the Mankind Project was born? Because it's not working in our societies. Um, so I have a slightly uh, different idea. I think it is working, Mm -hmm. um, but it's a lot more fashionable for us to focus on what is not working. So I've had for the last 10 years the privilege of seeing how well men supporting men is actually working. Um, So back to John Kennedy's quote. Yes, um, as uh, in the way the world has been structured, uh, in a very patrilineal way, there is immense pressure um, to kind of be uh, the John Wayne of having to to be the tough guy. Um, What the Mankind Project is about is how is it that men can be whole people and not the John Wayne stereotype, be good husbands, be good people, be good dads, be good sons and be good family men and be good community men in spite of and because of the pressure that's being put on them. That sounds uh, huge. That's it, massive. Is, I mean, is it, one, is it one journey? Is it one question answered? Is this a journey for life? And, and how does one embark on a journey like this? Um, well, if I knew the answer for that, <laughs> uh, I would be probably be as wealthy as Warren uh-huh. Buffett. Um, the way the project works... Um, you do the initial training, um, which is a very intimate, very intense training. And we arrogant enough to believe that within 48 hours, we can sufficiently expose men to a part of themselves that has been repressed forever by themselves and by society and by the way they've been brought up. And once that door has been opened, what we then do is to create sufficient safety nets and support uh, for men by men sitting in circle to help them relook and redecide who it is that they are. Of the key things that men walk away with from the weekend is first of all a commitment to take ownership for what it is that they do, whether those actions uh, and the consequences thereof are intended or unintended, 
we then help men to understand um, who they are from an archetypal point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, the way Kennedy puts it in his quote, that's the warrior or maybe even the mercenary, right? Mm -hmm. So we help men to understand that there's not just one dimension of who they are. And then we empower men um, to have a mission of service. And a mission of service is this massive big thing that gives people a reason to live, a raison d'etre. Um, it's not going to take a single lifetime to achieve. It could take multiple lifetimes to achieve, but the kind of thing that inspires people uh, to do, for example, what Nelson Mandela or Mahatma Gandhi has done, that gets people up in the morning and that makes people change and that change lives, communities and history. Mm, sounds wonderful. That is magical. It, it sounds magical. So when you, I, I passed you the brochure for, for Jody's exhibition and there are the pictures in front of yes. you, what, what is your immediate response um, to, to some of these pictures? Um, well, on the weekend, um, a lot of what we do is uh, not only going into um, uh, physically peeling off the layers of the onion, but at a deeply and very tender emotional level, empowering men and creating a sufficiently safe space at a very deep emotional level to allow men to journey into that space. Um, I found it very interesting when Jody said some of the men fall asleep mm. um, while they're in the underwear, while somebody is taking photos of them. For me, uh, I think that uh, attests to the fantastic skills that Jody has to be able to allow someone to, when they are naked or vulnerable or bare, to be able to relax to the extent that they can fall asleep. Mm. So I don't think it's boredom. I think it's a very deep primal sense of safety mm. Mm. Um, that Jody has created, which is why the photos are so magical. Uh, and we do some of that on the weekend as well. Well, not taking photos, or <laughs> not being good, uh, but being able to, to get men uh, to look at themselves in a safe way. And the concept of men being vulnerable? Um, well, we brought up in a society where uh, we taught that cowboys don't cry. Mm. In the community that I grew up in, um, colloquially known as the township, um, we were... Uh, there was a burden on us um, not to be weak or to be puny. So a lot of uh, learning um, and indoctrination had to be unlearn so that I can understand that that part of me is just one dimension of who I am and I can then choose to create depth and add different components of who I am without being ashamed or without being sad or without feeling that, you know what, actually I'm not fitting into who I was as Township Rurik, but I can add on to different dimensions of who I am. But how, what got you to that point of, of wanting to shift and to wanting to go deeply within? Well, I've always been blessed that uh, I've uh, seen myself as being introspective. And what is interesting, which is something that my wife reminds me of, is that all of the friends that I'm very intimate with are very deeply reflective people. Mm -hmm. um, I have to thank a man by the name of Eugene Oppold that was quite resilient uh, in inviting me uh, onto the weekend 10 years ago. Um, for about three years, maybe four years, I've always found a reason not to. Um, I've, I'm very left-brained, and uh, when he took me to one of the uh, presentations uh, or honoring ceremonies to see what the weekend was about, I was so clear that this is not for me. Oh, really? And um, eventually I surrendered. Um, he said, listen, there's another weekend. You want to join? And I said, sorry, can't go. Uh, I used to go to an F1 Grand Prix once. Yeah, I said, that's the Belgian Grand Prix. It's on that weekend can't do it. He came back to me and said, sorry, it was uh, the wrong date I gave you. Oh. That's the next weekend. <laughs> so I didn't have an excuse. Oh, no. And that's how I ended up on the weekend. And I've uh, been involved for 10 years. I'm certified as a co-leader in the project. And I've had the privilege of being invited around the world to lead these weekends. And one of the gifts that that has given me is to see the beautiful universality of the gentleness and the tenderness of what it is to be a man. Jody, we've got a few minutes before we take a break and I see you going, whew, the expression on your face. I mean, here you, you, you're peeling away the layers with your exhibition and here is a man talking about the tenderness and, and, and beauty of, of men. What, what do you have to say about I that? I just say that this is what I am striving for, that I am not an expert on men by any means. Mm. I saw the project and I knew it was important, but if I can just bring, you know, where other people who are working in this field and if we can shift people's ideas, for me that is most important. Mm. Let's take a break and we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Esvia Prinsler 
and I'm the HOD of IT integration at Bridwin Preparatory School in Melrose. We started using study apps about six months ago and have seen astonishing results. We were quite amazed to see how quickly the kids have been able to use study apps and the benefits it has shown with regards to reinforcing what they've already learned inside the classroom. I would highly recommend study apps for any school. Studyapps.co.za well, welcome. If you have just joined us, thank you so much. It's lovely to be with you. I'm Nikki Seberini, and you're listening to Conversations with Nikki. And this is where we keep you entertained, informed, and inspired. Welcoming our syndication partner listeners at Eldos FM, Chai FM, Kawi FM, West Coast FM, MC 90.3 FM in Plettenberg Bay, Nisne FM, Wild Coast FM, and Bay FM. And uh, again, you know, please do visit that website, Conversations with Nikki, which is one word, Nikki spelled N-I-K-I, and that's dot C-O dot Z-A. If ever you leave the conversation, you'd like to come back, I do podcast each show each week, so all the shows that have been on Conversations with Nikki are there on the website. And um, yes, and you can also communicate with me via the website. I'd love to hear from you. I want to know what's on your mind. I would like to know what you're enjoying, and uh, perhaps you have interesting stories that you'd like to share with the Conversations with Nikki audience. I'd love to hear from you. So we're having a discussion about men in society. I have Jody Bieber in the studio. She is a South African award-winning photographer. Her photograph of Bibi Aisha, a woman from Afghanistan whose ears and nose were severed by her husband and brother-in-law, was selected as the World Press Photo of the Year in 2010. Um, she has produced amazing books, phenomenal exhibitions, and she has an exhibition on at the moment at the Goodman Gallery, and it's called Quiet. And it's peeling away the layers um, that we have in our society of our perception around men, mis masculinity, power, looking at the more vulnerable side um, of, of man. And I also have Rurik Makeza from the Mankind Project who's talking about um, real, I'm quoting from, um, from your website, uh, Rurik, real powerful men. A very, very interesting conversation. Um, Jody, just before the break, we were talking about you know what what Rurik is doing and um, allowing men to go deep within and to explore all aspects of of that which which it is to be a man. Do you think this kind of conversation, um, especially with your exhibition and, and having the speakers come along on Saturday, do you think these are the kind of conversations we should be having around South Africa? In other words, your kind of exhibition, do you think we should take it to to more areas so that? That, that it can ignite debate so that men can, can talk comfortably about showing a vulnerable side? I'm really hoping that people that are academics, um, people in government, people in different professions, even if they don't like art and photography and don't go to galleries, to just go and have a look. And from that, if they can create something wherever they are, be it, for example, a school, and they create a project, why has Jodie Bieber taken photographs like this? Mm. And I don't know, I want it to be a catalyst so things spread. I mean, just turn on the TV today. We need things to happen. Mm. Well, also joining the conversation is a man who has stood up and uh, he's decided to look at men and look very specifically at fathers. Um, he started up FAN, which is Father and Nation. His name is Craig Wilkinson. But before we take you on, Craig, we just have to play something from the website, which I found very powerful. And it starts off and it says, Fatherlessness and wounded, wounded masculinity have caused more damage to humanity than war and disease combined. There is no greater nation building imperative for South Africa than the restoration of men and fathers. FAN is starting a movement which will change our nation. As a man, I pledge to fight for what is right and good. As a man, I pledge to use my strength to love, protect and provide for my loved ones. As a man, I pledge to live by conviction and not convenience. Define myself not by material possessions, but by my character, values and the way I treat people. 
Our mission is to restore men and fathers to be great fathers and great role models. We're starting a movement based on a single principle. If we can heal men, we can heal society. I firmly believe that if every man in South Africa stood up and said, I'm going to be a real man and a real father, our nation would change overnight. And that's what FAN is all about, calling men to do that. Men all around the country can join us by taking the FAN pledge. As a father, I pledge to truly see my children, engage with my children to regularly set aside quality time to be with them without distractions. As a father, I pledge to affirm my children by accepting who they are. As a father, I pledge to love my children by the things I say to them and the way I treat them. Help my children to discover their unique identity. Protect my children physically, emotionally and spiritually. Teach my children what they need to know to succeed in life. Are you man enough to take the pledge? Are you man enough to take the pledge? Are you man enough to take the pledge? Yeah, Father a Nation, um, Craig Wilkinson, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. It's good to be with you. So, Craig, we, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to bring in our other guests um, because we we're having an interesting discussion, and I I'm I'm interested to know what what Rurik has to say about the whole concept of being man enough and taking responsibility as a father and a, and a, a man in society. But let's first let's first talk about you, Craig. I mean, why did you start Fan? Why why was Father a Nation important to you? Uh, two parallel journeys, really, Nikki. One was um, as a father myself, and, and unfortunately a divorced father, who's now remarried seven years later. I have two beautiful children. One is now uh, turning 21 this year, Luke. Uh, he's a boy. And a girl uh, who's 17, Blythe. And just the journey of walking with them as a father um, was absolutely amazing. Um, it, it's something that just completely changed my life and me and uh, forced me to man up, to look in the mirror and see what needed to change. Because I realized that you can only impart to your children what you have inside to impart. And as a man, you need to make sure that what you've got to impart inside is the right stuff. And uh, Luke, uh, when he, uh, two years ago, uh, just after my birthday, he wrote me a letter which absolutely blew me away. I mean, it, it's a letter I couldn't read for a long time without tears just running down my cheeks. Just a letter of acknowledgement and thanks for, for the role I played as his father. Uh, it was an unsolicited letter. Mm. That was the one journey. The other journey was I had been working for quite some time in, a, in, in townships uh, doing economic empowerment and development and enterprise development and just began to realize that we were really just scratching the surface, that the, the issues uh, in these communities were so much deeper than what we were dealing with. And we did a lot of research, looked at schools and headmistresses and headmasters and NGOs in the area and families, and we really nailed it down to the fact that households were really struggling. And we, as we examined households, we realized that the biggest issue in households was a lack of fathers mm. or absent fathers or abusive fathers. And the households that had good, uh, strong, engaged fathers were streets ahead of the rest. So, so that was kind of the birth of, of the reason. And we, we thought if we can, fa we can father a new nation if we restore men to be role models and fathers. I want to ask you, Craig, I mean, when you first got married, you got divorced, you said you were a single parent, yes. um, and you, you realized that you had to shift when you, you, know, when you were bringing up your, your young son and your, your young daughter at the mm -hmm. time. So what was it? I mean, what was it that, that shifted? What, how, how were you able to see yourself? How were you able to go deeper within so that you could provide them um, with the, the qualities as, as a single parent, the yes. right qualities? Look, I, th I think a couple of incidents happened. So, firstly, I, you know, I fell madly in love with my children when they were born. Mm -hmm. When my daughter was two years old, she had to have a surgery on her heart for a, a small hole in the heart. Mm -hmm. And I asked the surgeon if I could go in and just be there as she went under and also that I could be the first person she saw when she woke up from the anesthetic. And he kindly allowed me to do that. And I did. I held her. She went under and was there when she woke up. And about three weeks later, she was three at the time, I heard her talking to a friend. I overheard her saying that my heart... Uh, what used to be broken but my daddy fixed it oh. and it was it was all events mm. like that where you realize you're actually the hero in, in these young people's lives and the most important man in their life mm. and so how you live your life is just absolutely crucial and what you do and what you give so I uh, no, no man reaches adulthood unwounded and unscathed in some way mm. and generally the wound comes from his father because that that relationship such a profound and powerful one where the man, the boy, takes his question to his father, and the question generally is, Dad, do I have what it takes? Uh, am, I, am I good enough? Am I, am I strong enough, powerful enough? Can I do this? 
And most dads, because they haven't had the question answered themselves out of a sense of inadequacy, don't answer their son's questions properly. So much of the behavior that, that drives men is, is, is a desperate need to be validated. And so you, you can put down most of men's stupid behavior down to just a desperate need to be validated and to be powerful. Uh, I, could, I could go on and on, but let me stop there. I love what you're saying, Craig. I mean, what, if you don't mind me asking, what was the relationship like with your father? It was a difficult one, um, very distant. I mean, my dad come from a background of, you know, children should be seen and not heard, mm. uh, stiff upper lip, no, uh, you know, big boys don't cry. Yeah. And, and so what that does is it leaves a boy to answer his own questions. Uh, and, and, and there's a, you know, there are lots of lies in society about what it is to be a real man. So we get the answer from our peers. Right. And in the absence of a validating man or group of men, and it doesn't have to be a biological father, it can definitely be, uh, you know, just an older man or, or, or company of men. You know, in traditional African culture, there's the, the elders, which, which play a massive role in the validation of, of a young boy. So you know, I never had that. Most of my peers growing up didn't have that to some degree. And so we fill in the gaps with junk. It's so interesting you say that because, the, Jody, that's really what your exhibition is about. Because you, you spoke about being a gym, looking at images of men the whole morning, and they were portrayed in a very specific way, be it sportsmen or politicians or singers or whatever it is. And if, if you're saying, Craig, that you can't go to your father to get the, the right role model when it comes to being a man in this world, and you're going to be relying on your peers or you're going to be looking at TV or looking at role models there, then it is going to perhaps be a very misguided way of, of being a man in this world. Jody, what, what do you want to say? Do you have a comment on that, Jody? I mean, you do notice now, like, wherever I go, I see men carrying children, you know, which is something that I think you never used to see before. Mm -hmm. And That's so a David Beckham syndrome. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> making light of it, but I mean, you know, no, he's honestly, a man that a lot of young, young men look up to, and he's, he's a great father figure. And but what I do feel is lacking is that I think that it's very much in the middle to upper class that um, a lot of education and that is there around men allowing themselves to be not more vulnerable but not they don't have to be you know a good soccer player and they don't have to be powerful and I mean if you hear and listen to some of the music um, house music like Millie Mm -hmm. which speaks about having a million rand and throwing it away and then getting the BMW. And young people are listening to this, mm -hmm. and this is the kinds of pressures that I think are sitting on, on our youth. So, Craig, back to you. I mean, you, you, you went to your peers. This is where you got your, your insights around what it was to be a man. So perhaps you can just continue with that. Well, I mean, there are two elements to this. One is that the, the lies around men that are just common in most of our cultures, it, it, it's about sex, power, and money. Mm -hmm. So men need to, to be a real man, you have to have power, whether it's physical power, dominance or whatever you need to be able to attract beautiful women and have lots of women running after you and you need to have lots of money I mean mm -hmm. that's those are the three basic lies so a lot of our culture and our misdoings are around those things so those are the kind of lies we get from society media and our peers the second thing is that masculinity is, is an, something that's imparted so uh, where you have a, uh, in our South Africa now and, and internationally you have a lot of men growing up without fathers in their life so you've got these amazing single moms just sacrificing and doing just incredible things to raise boys. But the one thing they can't do is they can't impart masculinity mm. to them. They can't validate the masculinity of the boy. Mm. So you get uh, boys that are angry and resentful about that. So in a case when you, when you grow up without a dad, number one, you, you listen to the lies. And number two, you don't have an impartation and a validation of uh, masculinity to you. So you grow up, you know, a man that grows up valid has no need to prove his manhood. I often say you don't have to play the man to be the man. You are the man, mm -hmm. and so much more so if you don't have a constant need to prove it. Mm -hmm. So the guys that Jody experienced, you know, the vulnerability, a man who's very secure in himself and has been validated and knows what it is to be a man is not afraid to be vulnerable because that's part of who we can be. Mm -hmm. 
Ruik, what do you have to say about this so far? Uh, wow, wow, wow. Uh, Craig, uh, <laughs> Craig sounds like uh, one of the founder members of uh, the Man Can Project. So <laughs> I, I have done your program. I have been on the course, and it's wonderful. Oh, wow. Fantastic. I thought the name looks familiar. <laughs> nice to talk to you again, Craig. Yes, indeed. It's absolutely it's awesome stuff you're doing, yes. and uh, the mission that you're on is absolutely phenomenal. Thank you, and, and you too. Thank you. You know, I had Stephen Bidoff on the on the show a few weeks ago, and he's the author of Raising Girls and Raising Boys. And Raising Boys was uh, such a huge uh, uh, be- bestseller because it answered so many questions around uh, what is a what is a young man in this world. And 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 he also wrote a book called Manhood. And and he spoke about the first six years of a young boy's life. The mother plays a pivotal role. Um, she shows him how to love. She shows shows him about affection, touch. And then from 6 to 14, the father plays a very important role because he's learning, as you've just, yes. both of you have said, what it is to be male. Yes. And then from 14 onwards, um, the, the role, the important role, then lies on, on a, in, in a mentor or a role model. Yes. And that's kind of where I got stuck because I look around. I mean, Jody, you, 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 again, we're going to talk about role models. We're going to talk about switching on the TV and seeing the famous soccer players or the singers listening to the music. Are these the role models that we're exposing um, our young men to? And where, where on earth, Craig, do we get the right role models from? Well, unfortunately, there's a very serious lack of, of role models, and, and that's a major, major problem. You see, the thing is, men, men, boys and girls are very different. And I think what happens is, even in the educational environment, you know, you have something like four or five times more boys being diagnosed with ADD than girls. Mm-hmm. And I, I put it down a lot to the environment. A, a young boy is not designed to be an environment. You know, boys have this thing called testosterone, which is maligned a lot, but it's, it can be a beautiful thing if... if, if if affirmed in the right fashion and given the right uh, outlet. So if you have a boy that's in a, in a, in a classroom situation is forced to sit still and to listen and to, you know, it just, he just gets so frustrated. And it's not necessarily something wrong with the boy, just he needs expression. Mm-hmm. So a lot of boys grow up, as you say, with, uh, they, they aren't the role models. And the ones that are, and this is the, like in the Cape where I am, we have this massive gangsterism issue because the role models become the gang leaders. Mm. They become the patriarchs of this gangster family. And what boys get from that is they get validation. They get a family. They get accepted. Uh, they, they have to do terrible things to get there. But that's who many many young boys are looking to. So as uh, your, your organization, Father a Nation, are you able to perhaps provide role models to, to go into communities and look at role models, who, who, you know, people who are changing the communities as opposed to, to gangsters? I mean, is that one of your greatest challenges? Absolutely. I mean, what our program aims to do is raise up a standard in South Africa of what it means to be a real man and put men through, you know, similar to, to what Uri's doing with the Mankind Project, intense training processes over a period of time. And, and the book I wrote, uh, the book called Dad, talks of 12 dad verbs. And these are things that every dad needs to do, these 12 dad verbs. But w- within each dad verb is a man's skill. So when the first dad verb is to see, you, you truly need to see your child. You know, if, if you're a, a, a Rambo-type guy and your child, your boy happens to be a poet, you need to see the poet and not try and push onto the boy the fact that, you know, you want him to be a rugby player. Mm. If you, whatever your, your young girl um, is, you need to be able to see the essence of her soul, what makes her heart come alive and delight in that. Mm. So, so these are the kind of things that we need to teach and train men throughout South Africa and all different communities. And if we can raise up a group of men, an army of men that are saying, you know what, and this is really much what the Mankind Project does. They work man by man and transform and put these men back into communities, and then they become the role models, and they start a transformation process. Mm. So that's really what we're all trying to do, is transform a critical mass of men, and then raise the bar to say, you know, if a man behaves badly in South Africa, he needs to, it needs to be so conscious of the fact that what he's doing is not really manly. Like, for instance, I, I would say that uh, if, if there's a child falling asleep tonight, uh, crying for her father, and you're that father, you've lost your right to call yourself a man. You know, if, if we've got that kind of message out there, then men are going to say, okay, it's not so cool to do that. You know, if I'm verbally abusing a woman, let alone physically, uh, and the message in South Africa is strong, it's just not cool to misuse your strength in any way mm. to, to dominate anyone. It's not, uh, if men start seeing that in South Africa, we raise the bar and the standard, then I think we're beginning to, to, to uh, fulfill our mission. So without sounding too cliched, it's one man at a time.
and you believe that with one man changing at a time, you can change the nation? Well, we need him. We need a critical mass, but absolutely. It, mm -hmm. it starts, it, it's a man okay. at a time, absolutely. Okay, but we have to now look at the question, um, how many fatherless uh, uh, families there are in, in our society, in our communities, and how many child-headed households there are. So there are some children who are fending for themselves who have neither a mother nor a father. And this, these, are, these are young children who are going to be growing up. They're going to be playing a very important role in our society. What do we do when there isn't a father around? So he can't even man up because he's nowhere to be found. Yeah, you know, firstly, that question, I think, is pivotal to the future of South Africa. Yeah, I because do too. Because their the estimates are frightening. Up to four to five million overseas orphans and vulnerable children by the year 2015. Mm -hmm. That, in the future, can destroy this country. And the reason is that kids who grow up without any form of um, parental guidance uh, or empathy or love often can develop into children who have an inability to empathize and to understand societal norms. And they can go completely wrong to mm -hmm. the point where they can actually murder without feeling any um, any sorrow. Right. So we actually are raising an army of very dangerous and damaged people. The the answer to your question though is that if if there are enough elders in the community, so it doesn't have to be a biological father or even a relative, mm -hmm. but elders in the community. And, and I'll give you a quick example from Pilansburg. It's, it's an example from, from elephants. But w when they relocated certain, some elephants to the Pilansburg Game Reserve some years ago, as opposed to culling them, when they became teenagers, these elephants, male elephants, started causing absolute havoc, killing rhino, charging tourists. And naturists didn't understand what was going on because so they'd never seen it. But then they bought two bull elephants from uh, Kruger Park. And within weeks, the problem was solved because these bull elephants, and that's what our society needs, is bull elephants, mm. done, good men, mm. good men that can be in the community and just set the standard of what it is to be a man. Yeah. Sorry, I go on. No, no, no. I, I, I love it when you do it. I love what you're saying. So, Rurik, let, let me bring you in here because mm -hmm. where, where, where are we going to find those bull elephants? You, people, are, men are coming on this mankind project. They're changing the way they are. How, how, do we, how do we break down centuries of the way men and, opera, uh, men and women operate and, and, and still see men within their power, women within their power? Mm. We don't have to lose the matriarch and the patriarchal roles. Right. Um, but how do we break down that idea that the man is the all-powerful right. and that the woman is not? And, and therefore, he, you know, he has a responsibility to a family, um, mm. to his offspring, right. um, and that he's not just going to spread his seed and just move on and, and, and continue because that, that just seems to be this ongoing pattern and, and how, how do we break again? Yes. I, I'm, re I'm, I'm repeating the question again. Um, exactly what Craig is saying, uh, one man at a time. I'm just, um, I would like to think that um, hopefully, possibly the Mankind Project has helped uh, men like Craig Wilkinson and Craig to crystallize their mission uh, right. to be able to do what they're doing. Okay. Um, so um, how do we do this? Um, I think very slowly. Um, and at the end of the day, um, for me, I would uh, want to risk in saying that how do we look at the core fundamental issue in society, which is diversity, mm -hmm. and at a species level of homo sapiens, for me it's boy-girl, mm -hmm. which is effectively what Craig is speaking about. So how do we as men get to that space of realizing in the way that Stan Lee, through Peter Parker, a.k.a. Spider-Man, said, with great power comes great responsibility. And how do we as men own our power and responsibility to be able to be called real men and redefining what it means to be a real man, um, being a dad, being a husband, being a provider, being gentle, being tender, and being strong, all of that in one. Um, and what the Mankind Project is doing, and what I clearly hear Craig is doing, is helping men find a way to get back to that uh, space of being authentically a community man, plugged into a community, being the bull elephant, and being willing to risk uh, doing what is necessary to get the younger elephants in line to be better people. Okay, so for young men who yeah. are listening to the show right now and they think, oh, 
Well, this Mankind Project sounds outstanding, and uh, Father and Nation sounds fantastic, but I, I don't have access to either. Right. Um, and I want to start on a journey. I, yes. I, I want to be able to go within, and I want to be able to find my power and my place and do good with it. Yes. What would you say to, to young men and to, to young women who are listening as well? I mean, what kind of conversations should they be having? having? Um, so to the women, I would say uh, make sure that you get your man uh, onto a, a new warrior training adventure mm -hmm. or to find men uh, like uh, Craig Wilkinson at FAN. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'd say to the women. Uh, to the men, uh, I would say listen to your women. Uh, find MKP. We're on the website. Uh, we have a website. It's the Mankind Project. Uh, dot org, uh, dot ZA. Uh, there's a couple of telephone numbers here that I'm happy to give. Our next training, uh, in, there's a training actually happening right now in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. uh, that training is full. We do four to five trainings per year, uh, two in Johannesburg, two in Cape Town, and for the last two years, uh, one in the Neisner region in the Southern Cape. Um, and we do five of these trainings per year. We can at most only accommodate 40 men on a training, so it's a slow process. How long is the training usually? Uh, it starts on a Friday evening at around 5, 36 o'clock, and just after lunch on Sunday, we say goodbye to mm. 40 beautifully newly transformed and So quick, men. so quick, the transformation. Well, the training is opening up the gateway uh, to a man's heart, to a different way of being, and giving him some very basic tools to get into a space of being a man with a mission. And once that training is done, we then expose men in a supportive way into what we call the I groups or the uh, PIT, uh, primary integration training, so that we don't send men away on a Sunday all rah, rah and pumped up mm -hmm. and not giving them the equipment and the technology to integrate the intense transformation journey that they've been exposed to, then men in the community, uh, men like Craig and myself, will support the men that have just graduated through this training on an 8 to 15 week uh, journey where we get together and we help men literally unpack what it is that they've learned and who it is that they believe they are mm. and who it is that they wish to become in the world as men with missions. Mm. Um, so how do we get uh, men onto the weekend? Go to our website. I, I don't know. You need to cue me. I I've got a couple of telephone numbers here. Our next Johannesburg training is uh, on uh, the 23rd of May mm -hmm. and thereafter we're doing one in October, the 24th of October. But uh, all these details I presume are on your website. All the details. And the website is? www www.mankindproject.org.za Fantastic. So, Craig, I mean, you went on, on one of these weekends away, and obviously it was a life-changing experience for you. But you, w w at what point did you go on the Mankind Project? At, at what stage of, of your development? Um, I went on the project about seven years ago. Okay. Uh, this was one of the early ones, and it, yeah, it was powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. Their training methodologies are very, very profound. And, and powerful, very worthwhile going on. Okay, so I'm going to ask you the same question, but I'm going to ask you to be a little bit more practical in terms of for young men who are listening right now who maybe can't go on, on a wonderful journey like this, but, you know, they, there's something, there's a, there's a spark, and they want yes, to yes. shift and they want to change. How, yeah. how do they start to open up and to go deeper? How, where and how does that start? Gee, that's a big question. I, I would say first Okay, well, I, I know it's a huge... I, I should have asked you that an hour ago, and we no, don't no. have a lot of time. <laughs> I'd say the first step is to just embrace and, and, and celebrate and affirm their own masculinity. Masculinity mm -hmm. is a beautiful and powerful gift to the world, number, number one. Secondly, be intentional. Uh, seek out mentors. And some of those mentors can be books I've read extensively. They can be workshops. They can be pastors of churches. That, you know, seek out mentors through books, etc., etc., and and be intentional about finding mentors. Most older men would love to mentor, mm. um, but a lot of older men also don't, don't feel valid. So if someone comes to me and says, please, would you teach me? They love it. So it's a real win-win situation. Don't be afraid to approach someone don't to be, be a mentor. Don't okay. be afraid. Right. And seek out people who are excellent in the areas that interest you mm. uh, to mentor you and approach them or read what they do, see what they do, model them. Don't seek out the gangsters and the, you know, the, the, the corporate gangsters or the, or the, 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 you know, the, the, the Cape Flats gangster type. You know, seek out good men, ask them what they do, and ask them to mentor you. 
Craig, thank you so much. It has been a, a real joy having you on the show, and you're doing such phenomenal work. It's, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, that was Craig Wilkinson, um, and he started FAN Father a Nation. And Rurik uh, Makeza, thank you so much for coming on as well and for, for sharing your insights uh, around men and uh, going deeper and, and finding that beautiful place. So thank you. Thank you. Only a pleasure. And Jody, I mean, you started the, the conversation, you know, getting men to peel away those layers and uh, be who they perhaps want to be but are maybe a little bit too scared to, and that is your, your exhibition, Quiet, at the Goodman Gallery. So thank you. What, what's, what's next in store for you? Um, there's a mid-career show, a nearly 100-print show, that's happening at the Witz Art Museum. The official opening is on the 17th. Lovely. And then I'm going to be going around with Jackson Katz. Um, oh, doing the talks on, on men. Going, yeah, do, um, showing my work, and then he's going to be presenting um, a talk. And we're hoping to get to policy makers. We're hoping to get to different NGOs. We, yes. We're really going to try. And I'm going to uh, continue this project. For me, I would like to go and photograph men in different parts of the world, then bring a book out. That would be interesting. And what happened today is exactly what I wanted to happen. I want the conversation to continue. Oh, wonderful. Jody Bieber. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you've been inspired, entertained, informed. Go forth. Be a happy person. I look forward to being with you same time next week for me, Nikki Seberini. Goodbye. Hi. My name is Esvia Prinsler, and I'm the HOD of IT integration at Bridwin Preparatory School in Melrose. We started using study apps about six months ago and have seen astonishing results. We were quite amazed to see how quickly the kids have been able to use study apps and the benefits it has shown with regards to reinforcing what they've already learned inside the classroom. I would highly recommend study apps for any school. Studyapps.co.za Conversations with Nikki was brought to you by Studyapps.co.za South Africa's leading education app for tablets.